Okay, so today we are going to talk about malignant tumors of the epidermis. This is the outline of the lecture. So we'll discuss actinic keratosis, Bowen's disease, squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthomas, basal cell carcinomas, Paget's disease, and lymphoepithelioma-like carcinoma. Actinic keratoses, as many of us know, are scaly thin papules. Sometimes they can be as large as plaques. They can occur on sun-damaged skin and are a sensitive indicator of exposure to UV light. Less than 10% of these, these are thought to progress to SCC, and, in, and many uh, references actually estimate a much lower percentage. So depending on which paper you read, um, you could see as low as less than 1%. I like to tell my patients that if we uh, skip freezing about 50 to 100 of them, then one of them will eventually turn into a squamous cell carcinoma. So we like to take that low percentage and uh, you know, turn it into zero by treating these when we see them. So uh, these are often dry and gritty scaly lesions on an erythematous base. On histology, you're going to see disorder of the keratinocytes, especially at the basal layer with some hyperplasia, some crowding, and atypia of the epidermal keratinocytes. And the key to separate this out from Bowen's disease is that you don't have full thickness atypia. So if you can see my arrow here, this is where most of your atypia is. But as you go up higher, you see that the cells are still maintaining maturation. There's a granular layer formation. There's flattening of the keratinocytes. There's some transition into um, stratum corneum, some areas with orthokeratosis and some areas with perikeratosis. Now, you'll notice that in this actinic keratosis, the granular layer and the orthokeratosis is preserved in areas where the adnexal structures are. And so the dysplasia kind of skips the adnexal structures. Um, and whenever you go to the interfollicular regions, you'll see that the loss of granular layer and that uh, perikeratosis is very evident. And so this sharp cutoff here is also referred to as the flag sign, uh, as mentioned here over to the left side. Of course, with a abundant sun exposure, you're gonna have a lot of solar elastosis present as well. The other thing about actinic keratosis is they can have broad-based budding. So here you have these islands that are very bulbous and budding. Um, depending on how much uh, basophilic staining they take up, you could even confuse them for a superficial basal cell in some instances, although not as much in this picture, but in real life cases, there are some that look very similar to basal cells. And so doing a burr at four, just to make sure that the burr at four is negative can really help you um, uh, increase your confidence that it's just an actinic keratosis and not a superficial basal cell. So in this picture, you see these broad-based buds of atypical keratinocytes. They're commonly seen extending downward from the epidermis and the budding can become pretty complex as well. And it, it can sometimes be difficult to separate superficially invasive carcinoma, especially if there's a tangential sectioning and you can't really delineate clear connections, but um, you kind of have to take it into account with the overall architecture of the lesion that you're seeing. Just more about actinic keratosis. This picture, you can see that the epidermis is relatively more atropic than what we saw in the previous examples, but there's this hyperplasia, this increased concentration, loss of polarity of the basal layer. So instead of having an apical to basal uh, polarity to them, they're just mainly becoming very round epithelioid. Um, if you were to flip it upside down, you couldn't tell which part should be closer to the basement membrane and which part should be farther from the basement membrane. And so that's what we mean when we say loss of polarity. But as you go up here in the upper half, there's still a maturation. So you have um, some granular layer, you have some uh, high, compact hyperorthokeratosis. I usually like to make the diagnosis of AK when I don't have the granular layer, um, because that suggests that you're having this, uh, increased proliferation and you'll typically have overlying perikeratosis. I rarely make the diagnosis of actinic keratosis when I have such a nice granular layer over the top, but this is probably a really early um, actinic keratosis here, and it hasn't fully developed that scaly perikeratosis on top of it. Just a little bit more factoids about actinic keratosis. Some estimate 8 to 20% gradually transform into SCC if left untreated. This was actually from Whedon. So again, the, uh, this actually suggests a higher percentage here. And so, and you'd be thinking about one in five uh, actinic keratosis that you didn't freeze in the clinic could turn into 
uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. So it's better to treat them as we see them. Um, per individual lesion uh, per year, it's also estimated that 0.53% uh, progression per each actinic keratosis per year could turn into a squam. There is frequent coexistence in patients with other basal cells and squamous cells, and that's not surprising because they correlate with sun exposure. Morphologic expressions of SCCIS. Um, so Ackerman uh, referred to this idea that, you know, this is basically uh, just a variant of an SCCIS. It's a little bit controversial. And um, Clay Cockrell mentioned that actinic keratitis should be renamed keratinocytic intraepidermal neoplasia or solar keratotic intraepidermal squamous cell carcinoma. Because again, um, <clears throat> there is, uh, this exists on a spectrum. And so you may have some actinic keratosis that are pretty difficult to uh, completely separate from squamous in situ, just depending on how advanced it is. Acanthalytic actinic keratosis is a variant of actinic keratosis where you have acantholysis around the atypical cells. So you still see the crowding, the disorder, and the, the atypia of epidermal keratinocytes. You also see focal acanthalysis or breaking apart um, of the adhesions between the keratinocytes. You have an overlying malignant horn oftentimes, so a loss of um, granular layer and a thick perikeratosis, and you can have a complex epidermal budding, which may be present as well. And here you see an example of the budding of those atypical cells. Again, depending on how much um, hematoxylin staining or how basophilic this looks, depending on the specific section, it could look a little bit more like a basal cell. And so again, doing a burrep four to make sure that it's negative it, it can be helpful, especially if it's a high risk area, such as the face, and you really want to make sure that you're not going to miss a basal cell carcinoma and call it an actinic. Also, the acanthalysis makes it very important too, just to assess that there is absolutely no invasion because acanthalysis is more often seen in acantholytic squamous cell carcinomas. Another variant of an actinic keratosis is a lichenoid actinic keratosis. So again, you see the crowding, the disorder, and the atypia of the epidermal keratinocytes, but the variant here is defined as an area of lichenoid interface dermatitis underlying it. So here you see this really nice thick lymphocytic band-like inflammation, it's abutting the basement membrane and obscuring the basement membrane. You have um, keratinocytic degeneration with colloid body formation. You can see over here to the periphery, some keratinocyte atypia. In the center, you see kind of a loss of granular layer and uh, focal perikeratosis. Um, so it, this is uh, a lichenoid actinic keratosis, but uh, the differential diagnosis could, al could also include a benign lichenoid keratosis, especially if you were not able to definitively define the uh, atypical keratinocytes here. Hypertrophic actinic keratosis are much thicker clinically, and you can see why on histology. Again, you have the crowding, the disorder, and the atypia of epidermal keratinocytes, but, but now you have a prominent overlying malignant horn. You have acanthosis often with complex epidermal budding, and red fibrotic stroma, which often displaces the solar elastosis downward. So uh, really getting in close on high power and making sure you do have preserved maturation is going to be important because this could be an evolving squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Oftentimes, if it's broadly transected at the base, we still have to sign it out as, um, you know, at least hypertrophic actinic keratosis, but broadly transected because if we do not see what's underneath this, we're still not sure if there's any type of invasive component, despite the preservation of maturation on the top. Um, and we can say we favor hypertrophic actinic, but definitely clinically follow and correlate. If there's a significant residual lesion left, um, you might e even consider a conservative but complete excision or uh, just treatment of the residual uh, lesion that was transected with at least cryotherapy. Bowenoid actinic keratosis. I don't like to use this um, a lot because essentially what it what it sounds like is it's Bowens or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. But there are some uh, what I call, like to call tweeners or in between um, neoplasms, which look a lot like a actinic keratosis in most of it, but have features of bulbous hyperplasia, 
areas that seem like it, it's getting to be full thickness atypia. And so um, what I like to do is just say focal squamous cell carcinoma in situ if I find any area that's full thickness, but then say that the rest of it um, appears to be traditional actinic keratosis. Um, but uh, for those that like to sign uh, cases out as bonoid actinic keratosis, um, what they essentially mean is that it's uh, mostly an actinic keratosis where you're still not um, visualizing a dif uh, diffuse full thickness atypia. You're not seeing a lot of buckshot and trepidermal scatter. You're not seeing full thickness follicular involvement. So again, if it's not involving the follicles, um, then it's probably not yet a full-fledged um, Bowen's disease. So moving on to squamous cell carcinoma in situ, clinically these present a solitary erythematous and scaly or crusted plaques, papules or plaques, often clinically resembling even psoriasis or dermatitis. So Sometimes we do get biopsies asking to rule out a neoplasm and it's a rash or vice versa. So you really have to identify the atypia on histology to, to help the clinician get to the right diagnosis. Presentation as a non steroid responsive dermatosis is a classic clinical history. Immunocompromised patients are obviously at an increased risk. And unfortunately, 5% of these will become invasive. Here is a more hyperplastic and more developed squam squamous cell carcinoma. So here you can see full thickness atypia with loss of normal maturation in a windblown pattern. The malignant cells probably originate in the follicular epithelium. As the malignant cells migrate into the epidermis, they create this, uh, this pattern reminiscent of a buckshot scatter or nested pattern. You see malignant horns typically overlying these lesions. So when we say malignant horn, we typically mean a thick perikeratosis overlying an epidermis, which lacks a granular layer. You can see there's a lot of disorganization between where the stratum corneum ends and begins, and it kind of uh, delves down deeper into the neoplasm here. Um, you can see full thickness atypia with high mitotic activity in the upper layers as well. And if you were to flip this upside down and just ignore the stratum corneum, it would be hard to tell which is the uh, area closest to the basement membrane and which is the area closest to the stratum corneum. So it's kind of um, really a homogeneously neoplastic from top to bottom, uh, full thickness anaplastic atypia. Just some more pictures from Dr. Elson's textbook of Bowen's disease here, or Bowen disease. Uh, it's used both ways. Or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Here is another example on the right where you see more hyperchromatic nuclei and large hyperchromatic nuclei of keratinocytes, and they're located very high um, near where the granular layer uh, should be or the top of the stratum spinosum. And just another picture this time from Whedon's textbook to show you another example of full thickness atypia that you're going to see in Bowen's disease or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Just some more images, again, from Dr. Elson's textbook, demonstrating that buckshot scatter. So it's just kind of this, it's almost like a, a buckshot from a shotgun. It just kind of sprays these fragments of bullets out. Um, and it, where they land is a little bit random and, and kind of um, all over the place, but for vertically and horizontally um, distributed throughout the epidermis. Sometimes you can have clonal nesting where you have atypical keratinocytes nesting together, almost like as if they were melanocytes. Um, you can have a lot more atypical cells with very enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei. And if you go down to the basal layer, sometimes you can even see this crushed basal layer of where the normal keratinocytes used to be. Um, and, and this is like an evolving hyperplastic bones. You can see how atypical the cells are right above it. You can even have clear cell change in bones carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma or bones disease. So don't let that throw you off. It's very common to see uh, clear cell cytoplasm or, or clear cytoplasm within uh, various foci of the squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And this is a really nice example of that. 
Moving on to squamous cell carcinoma, this is the second most common cutaneous malignancy in the U.S. It often occurs in sun-exposed surfaces. It's more aggressive on the lips and the ears. There is double the risk for recurrence and metastasis. Squamous cell carcinomas can develop secondary to trauma or burns, radiation, scar, metastasizing. Um, and the uh, increased risk of in transplant patients, unfortunately, is 65% above baseline risk. So uh, immunosuppression greatly increases the risk of squamous cell carcinoma development. Here you see the development of very atypical keratinocytes invading into the epidermis. So this is a lot more than what you're going to see in um, an actinic keratosis or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Here's your normal um, epidermis basement membrane here. And then you had this development of clonal neoplastic cells starting to infiltrate the epithelium. Now, this is a pretty superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Most of the ones that we get are much more clearly invasive than this. You can also have acantholysis and even a desmoplastic change within the dermis. So what defines squamous cell carcinoma? It's atypical keratinocytes invading the dermis. Cells breaking through the basement membrane, islands of epidermis in the dermis, and desmoplastic dermal stroma. You can also have acantholysis, as I mentioned. Three grades are generally recognized. You can call it well differentiated, which means that most of the cells are still squamatizing as you would expect in a squamous neoplasm. But you can also have moderately differentiated where a significant portion of the neoplasm is not producing any keratin. It's hard to, to see in some areas that it could even be a squame, but overall there's enough keratinization areas that you can still call it a squamous cell carcinoma but typically these tumors are much more bluer than they are pink. And then poorly differentiated uh, squamous cell carcinoma, I like to describe it as there's no way you could really know it was a squamous cell carcinoma, except if you did immunohistochemical stains. So it's very hard to actually call it a squamous cell carcinoma in that sense. And that's what makes it very poorly differentiated. It's important when we see these, uh, these tumors to look for perineural invasion. Squamous cell carcinoma well differentiated. So for SCCs that are well differentiated, you're going to have that really nice keratinization present. So it becomes very clear that it is a squamous cell carcinoma. You see this infiltrative invasive growth pattern. And when you go on higher power, you'll see... Um, you know, a lot of nuclear pleomorphism and just uh, high levels of cellular atypia in, in most cases. Here is a, a representative example of a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see it's a lot more blue compared to the previous tumor. You have a higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and you can still see some keratinization. So that allows you to say, yes, it's a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, but most of it is actually this kind of more undifferentiated population of more basophilic staining cells. And usually it's about 25% or so. You can see these keratinizing islands and the rest of it would be um, mostly this blue tumor. Poorly differentiated, like I said, is going to look um, essentially like just a, an undifferentiated basaloid tumor most often. And you're not going to be able to tell that it's a squamous cell. So you're going to have to um, do some stains to make sure you're not dealing with another type of tumor. And here are some examples of some of the stains that you can do. Now, um, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas can also be spindle uh, in morphology. And so if you've got a spindle cell proliferation, um, it's important to remember this mnemonic SLAM, which uh, the neoplastic cells basically slam up against the epidermis. This is from Dr. Elson's book. Um, and he recommends doing the keratin stains like CK56. I'd also do um, both high and low molecular weight keratins. So doing a broad keratin sc screen as well as P63, which is a good stain to look for primary epithelial origin. To rule out a um, leiomyosarcoma, you'll wanna do a smooth muscle actin and a Desmond stain. The Desmond stain is gonna be much more helpful. 
A typical fibrous anthoma is a diagnosis of exclusion. And so if <clears throat> all of these stains are negative, including S100 or not included here, SOX10, um, if those stains are all negative, then you'll start to have to entertain the diagnosis of an AFX or atypical fibrous anthoma. Here is an example of a spinal cell squamous cell carcinoma. Um, now, this background of pink color is actually a uh, the collagen. So the atypical cells are the um, epithelioid to spindle cells within the dermis here. And you can see that on the upper left uh, side, it, this would be positive for keratins. Over here on the right side, you have atypical cigar shaped nuclei. There's some cytoplasm vacuoles, which you often see in smooth muscle. And so what we're looking at here is going to be a more representative of a leiomyosarcoma. Um, on the bottom left is an atypical fibrous anthoma. So doing all the immunohistochemistry, it'd be negative for almost everything. CD10 is often positive in these entities. And then melanoma. So if you did stains for SOX10 or S100, these cells would be highlighting um, the neoplastic cells. And so that supports a spindle cell melanoma. Here's just a, a snippet from the Elston textbook, again, describing the SLAM differential, which we just talked about. <clears throat> Here's another image of squamous cell carcinoma that's invasive. You see these nests, uh, an infiltrating uh, population of squamous cells that are atypical cytomorphologically and that are invading into uh, a dermis that's heavily, heavily covered in solar elastosis. Acanthalytic SCC, as the name implies, there is abundant acanthalysis between the atypical um, keratinocytes. So you see just a large breaking apart of cells, but then also those individual cells are highly dysplastic appearing. Baruchus carcinoma is another type of squamous cell carcinoma, but interestingly, um, the, the cells themselves don't look that atypical but they develop these pushing borders. And so it's an infiltrative, um, some people describe them as a bulldozing pattern into the epidermis. Uh, there are three kind of major types of Baruchus carcinoma. One is oral fluorid papillomatosis. Obviously that's in the mouth usually. Um, and that's a subtype of Baruchus, car Baruchus carcinoma. You can also have giant condyloma of Bushke and Lowenstein, which is, um, <clears throat> more often occurs in the groin region. And then on the foot, you have a subtype called epithelioma caniculata. And this is what's shown here. Baruchus uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Here you have mostly this well-differentiated glassy eosinophilic keratinocytes, and they have blunt rounded outlines, like I said. So this is where you have that bulldozing pattern. You can kind of see it here. Um, you really have to, to base the diagnosis on not only the clinical and the progression, but also the architecture of, of each particular lesion, because if you try to rely on cytomorphology, it's not always going to be that helpful. And that goes for cratoacanthomas too, which we'll mention soon. Okay, spindle cell we already covered. So cratoacanthoma kind of going along the same lines as a verrucous uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The individual keratinocytes are most often not that atypical, but it's more about the uh, cup-shaped uh, invasive architecture here. And keratoacanthomas are defined by this rapid growth and the ability to in involute spontaneously. Now, not all of them do that, but uh, a fair amount of them can involute spontaneously. And someone uh, once described it to me as these cells produce so much keratin that they basically keratinize themselves to death. So they kind of almost shut off their nutrient supply by making so much keratin. And uh, what ends up happening is eventually the, uh, the site where this tumor is forming will be able to recover once the tumor cells slowly die off. So here is kind of a, a keratoacanthoma at the peak of its existence. So you see this nice hyperkeratotic symmetric cup-shaped endophytic neoplasm. Now you can imagine if you were to shave off the top of this and you just got a bunch of hyperkeratosis and maybe some acanthosis, some papillomatosis, maybe some areas of hypergranulosis, it's gonna be really hard to make that diagnosis. So if you are um, 
suspecting your keratoacanthoma, you're going to do the pathologist a big favor by getting as much of the lesion as you can. So that way um, it increases the diagnostic capability. So some people do consider this a form of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And that's fair because um, some of these do not regress and um, some of these can eventually lead to invasion. The other uh, important point is that um, the invasive squamous cell carcinoma component comes by the fact that this does have an invasive architecture. So if you see how thick this is, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely separated from the overlying epidermis by variable orders of magnitude, I'd say probably up to half a centimeter um, in, in many cases, even uh, getting close to uh, a full centimeter in some cases uh, based on the thickness. So these can be quite large tumors. You can see hypergranulosis, you can see pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. <clears throat> you can see hair follicles that um, contain that hyperplasia around it and are kind of coalescing towards the center of the lesion. It's thought that acanthalysis is never present. So if you do see some acanthalysis, you might just go ahead and push it up to a squamous cell carcinoma, a more traditional squamous cell carcinoma. So comparing keratoacanthoma and squamous cell carcinoma, <clears throat> usually keratoacanthomas have pseudoepithelomous hyperplasia and hypergranulosis at the center of the lesion, whereas squamous cell carcinoma typically has these features at the periphery of the lesion. In keratoacanthomas, the cells are large, they're light pink, and they're glassy, whereas in squamous cell carcinomas, these cells are often large, light pink, and glassy as well. And so um, what you're going to have to notice more is the cellular atypia and maybe the nuclear pleomorphism in squamous cell carcinoma, because both of them are going to have so this glassy change. Dermal infiltrates uh, often include eosinophils and keratoacanthomas. Plasma cells are very common in squamous cell carcinomas, especially on the scalp or uh, near mucosal surfaces on the head and neck, et cetera. Now for keratoacanthomas, there is involvement of the eccrine gland. It actually uh, pushes down the eccrine glands, but in squamous cell carcinoma, these cells can actually invade the eccrine glands. Credoacanthomas are commonly trapping elastic tissue, but squamous cell carcinomas rarely trap elastic tissue. Like I said, credoacanthomas usually do not have acanthalysis, whereas squamous cells often have acanthalysis. You can see perineural invasion in both credoacanthoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and I think that that's why it's very fair to um, lump a credoacanthoma as a subtype of squamous cell carcinoma because it's invading even the nerves in some cases. Neutrophilic microabscesses are commonly seen in keratoacanthomas, but rarely seen in squames. And again, there's a little bit of a exception there. So if squames are secondarily uh, wounded and there's a acute wound healing or inflammation within that lesion, you can definitely see a lot of collections of neutrophils there, or if it's secondarily infected. The growth of a keratoacanthoma is explosive, but with a squamous cell carcinoma, it's typically slow, a little bit more indolent um, if it's a, a very well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Now, if it's a moderately differentiated or poorly differentiated squame, then that's going to usually show more aggressive growth too. And terminally differentiated um, keratinocytes are more often seen in keratoacanthomas compared to the uh, squamous cell carcinomas. There is a syndrome called Ferguson-Smith syndrome. This is a syndrome that is autosomal dominant, and it is largely documented in a Scottish uh, population. These patients often have multiple keratoacanthomas, sometimes even up to 100 or hundreds of them, that develop in early childhood, young adulthood, mostly in sun-exposed skin, but not exclusively, and the lesions are much slower to resolve and may be associated with greater tissue damage and scarring. Here's an example of Ferguson-Smith syndrome. Diffuse keratoacanthomas, as you can see on both arms bilaterally. A regressing keratoacanthoma is an interesting entity because depending on when you do biopsy of keratoacanthoma, if you biopsy it at the late stage where it's starting to regress, you see mostly this cup-shaped keratin cavity 
and a very thin epidermis that does not look atypical at all. And it could even be confused with an epidermal inclusion cyst here. So you kind of have to get this history of of a rapidly uh, growing neoplasm, and then later it was biopsied and it, and it looked like this. But typically epidermal inclusion cysts are gonna, going to be a little bit deeper seated um, because the punctum is usually not this wide uh, here. And so this is not a punctum, this is actually just the surface of where that um, crater meets the outside uh, environment. And the other thing is that cysts will not involute by themselves. So, um, you know, clinic, clinical behavior will also give you that, that hint or that diagnosis as well. And usually epidermal inclusion cysts are not hyperkeratotic clinically, and this would be hyperkeratotic because you would be able to see all of this keratin clinically as well. Proliferative epithelium has involuted to a thin wall resembling the lining of an epidermoid cyst, as I mentioned, and you can have a scar peripheral to the regressed epithelium. So if you think about uh, all of that destruction that the invasive keratoacanthoma did to the skin, as it heals up, you're going to actually have more of a, a scar-like uh, tissue with parallel collagen running and maybe even some vertical blood vessels as you would usually see in a scar. Moving on to basal cell carcinoma, the most famous tumor in all of dermatology, the most common tumor in all of dermatology. Um, obviously not the most dangerous, but um, definitely can be locally destructive and um, cause a lot of morbidity and, and even in some cases mortality if, if left very neglected. There are very um, rare instances where basal cell carcinomas can metastasize and there are basosquamous carcinomas which do have a worse prognosis and so Yes, um, nature has the ability to create tumors that have both basal cell and squamous cell components, but for intents and all intents and purposes, just for teaching, it's useful to understand what makes a basal cell carcinoma a basal cell carcinoma. So it is the most common cutaneous malignancy in the U.S. Uh, you often see pearly papules with prominent telangiectasias. Ulcerated lesions with a rolled border, also described as a rodent ulcer, and ulcers that never quite heal. So in clinic, if a patient says, oh, you know, my dog bit me, or oh, you know, that, that just came up last week, I'll say, okay, well, we need to give it time to heal, but if it doesn't heal, then we definitely need to biopsy it. If it doesn't have um, some of these classic rolled borders that you usually see. Sometimes uh, all you will see of an early basal cell carcinoma is an ulcer. And so if you have a high degree of suspicion and the patient will let you biopsy it, it's always a good idea to do a biopsy. You will often see uh, prominent telangiectasias overlying basal cell carcinomas as well, especially if it's not ulcerated. Basal cell carcinomas are also known as trichoblastic carcinomas. So trico indicates that it's coming from the hair follicle. And this is a, essentially a tumor that is related to hair follicle epithelium. Um, and that's why I think the burrep 4 stain is very specific for basal cell carcinoma because um, it, it basically stains tumors that are sharing um, in common entities of like the basal uh, the very basal matrical area of hair follicles, and those are positive for burrette 4. So here is an image that you can see these superficial basaloid buds coming from the top. You see peripheral palisading and a lot more uptake of the hematoxylin stain, which makes it this very bluish peripheral palisading tumor here. And if you were to do a burrette 4 stain, it would, it would basically be negative in all of this to, uh, tissue except for these basaloid islands where the basal cell carcinoma is forming. Interestingly, you see that there's a seeming, seemingly disconnection between these basaloid islands, but there's probably a little bit of a net-like network connection between um, these, these islands in different planes of section. And this isn't really discussed or proven, but I think that they can secrete other factors in the extracellular space that can induce the development of basal cell carcinoma at other foci, but that's just a hypothesis that I have. So the uh, histopathology, these tumors are defined by blue islands. You see peripheral palisading, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, retraction artifact. So 
If you see retraction artifact, that can be very helpful to um, distinguish this as a basal cell carcinoma versus some other type of adnexal tumor, especially if you're trying to differentiate between a related adnexal tumor entity called a trichoepithelioma, which usually you will not see it uh, looking superficial like this, but we will get into um, differentiation of basal and trichoepithelioma in later lectures. Also, the stroma around a basal cell shows this fibromyxoid change. So you get areas of thickened collagen bundles, but you also get um, areas of more dense mucinous stroma as well. Moving on to nodular basal cell carcinoma, probably the most commonly uh, diagnosed tumor in derm path. And so basal cell carcinomas that have a nodular architecture um, will kind of start to invade deeper into the dermis and then they'll have a lot more noticeable prominent retraction artifact here, as you can see. You see this uh, fibromyxoid stroma around the tumor compared to the, the dermis underneath it. This is more of a pinkish, bluish, cellularly rich stroma, as opposed to the normal dermis around it. Like I said, burrup 4 is the most useful stain to differentiate between um, uh, squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas. But it's important to remember that burrup 4 cannot help you distinguish between other adnexal tumors, such as a trichoepithelioma versus a basal cell, because it'll be positive in both of those. Usually it's more strongly positive in a, in a basal cell carcinoma, but um, it's not going to be very useful in helping you differentiate those uh, entities of trichoep and basal cell. So if you, if you get a basaloid looking squamous cell carcinoma, and you're really not sure if it's a basal cell or not, um, doing a burrup 4 and seeing that it's a negative will definitely increase your confidence if you're dealing with a squame. And that's very important prognostically because if you have a basaloid looking squame and it's negative for burrup 4 then you're probably dealing more with a moderate to even poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another example of that nodular basal cell carcinoma. You can see very nice peripheral palisading, some areas of focal retraction, um, lots of cellular atypia and pleomorphism, and uh, some surrounding mucin as well. Some of the basal cell carcinomas can get so large that they start to actually experience a necrosis in the center. So here is some uh, part of the tumor that just has kind of died off, it just lacking enough nutrients to stay alive. So that's kind of like a comedonecrosis-like effect. And you can have some very large atypical cells uh, described as monster cells in some of the larger basal cell carcinomas. This picture has a really nice uh, retraction artifact around most of the tumor. It's important to remember that if you shave off a portion of this and it's more superficial, that the tumor can actually slip out and dissociate from the shave biopsy. So you may just get this empty hole where you have this unexplained void in the tissue. And so you, you have to have a high degree of suspicion that there could have been a nodular basal cell and just sign that out in the report, even if you don't see evidence of it. Um, so the clinician is aware and may have to go back and, and take another biopsy. Micronodular basal cell carcinoma is characterized by aggressive worm-like growth into the dermis. So micronodular uh, architecture is usually very small basaloid islands with this thick intersecting collagen bundles in between each micronodule of basal cell carcinoma. So often um, these basal cell carcinomas, these nodular basal cell car carcinomas will have small micronodular appearing islands within the same tumor. And so you'll get something signed out as nodular and micronodular basal cell. But um, the truest uh, definition of a micronodular basal cell is going to be more of this isolated, small um, worm-like extension growth into the dermis separated by thick collagen bundles. And so I usually just call um, basal cell carcinomas, nodular basal cell carcinomas, if that's what I'm predominantly seeing. Um, but it, it doesn't hurt to describe that there are some smaller islands because micronodular variants are more aggressive typically. Same with the infiltrated pattern. And um, as you can imagine, just doing like a curatage of these lesions has a high failure rate because you're trying to scrape out the tumor, but it's interrupted by so many 
areas of thick collagen bundles, you can't physically remove um, the tumor by itself. So these have to be excised with negative margins. Similar to that, morpheiform basal cell carcinoma has these infiltrating strands of basaloid cells. They're spiky and look like they're essentially stabbing into the dermis. Um, you have sclerotic and fibrotic stroma surrounding each one of these infiltrating islands, and they have been likened to tadpole-like in terms of their shape, and you can have some small horn cysts, which may be uh, focally present. So Sometimes we have a nodular basal cell that actually transitions into some areas of morpheiform or infiltrated pattern. Um, clinically, these can actually just look like a scar. And so if uh, there's a worsening scar developing on somebody with no history of trauma, especially on the face uh, or back of an elderly gentleman with a lot of sun exposed skin or elderly um, uh, woman, male or, or female um, patients can, ha can have these. And so if there's a scar-like lesion developing and you have a high degree of suspicion, you definitely want to do a deeper, uh, maybe even excisional or punch biopsy just to get a sense of any infiltration that is happening. You can imagine if you just shaved off the top of this lesion, you're going to miss a lot of the action and that could potentially delay the diagnosis and delay uh, the patient getting the proper care. So uh, I always recommend to do a punch biopsy into these lesions so that way we can assess the depth um, of these as well. And that goes for uh, other lesions that are related to this, such as desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, which can look similar, and um, a uh, MAC, and that's basically a microcystic adnexal carcinoma. And those can invade deeply and have tadpole-shaped uh, neoplastic islands as well. So you definitely want to get a deep biopsy if you can. Uh, along those lines, the differential diagnosis, uh, like I mentioned, for desmoplastic trichoepithelioma or for morpheiform basal is including a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So this is actually not um, a malignant tumor here to the left and the malignant tumors to the right. And so how can you tell the difference? So with desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, you still have these, these um basaloid thin islands composed of one to two cell thick areas, um, some a little bit thicker with three or four or five cells, but um, they're also within this sclerotic or, or desmoplastic stroma. And you oftentimes see these horn cysts, you see areas of calcification. Um, and so that, that, that can help you differentiate between the morpheiform basal where you're gonna see less calcification. Usually you're not gonna see those horn cysts um, you'll see more retraction in a morpheiform basal compared to a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. And desmoplastic trichoepithelioma shouldn't really be invading much, and they shouldn't be showing any evidence of perineural invasion. Um, so morpheiform basal cells will. Now, in real life, um, when we just get small samples, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a morpheiform basal and a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So Clinically, uh, the information is important too. Usually the desmoplastic trichoepitheliomas are donut-shaped papules on the, the face of young people and morpheiform basal cells are usually more of scar-like um, papules or even plaques on <clears throat> highly sun-exposed areas of older patients. So you do have to take into account everything, but sometimes you do have to uh, uh, sign these things out as atypical basaloid proliferation and, and then the comment, describe what you favor. Um, there are some, uh, immunohistochemical studies you can do. If you do a CK20 stain to look and see if there are retained Merkel cells within the islands, if you see retained Merkel cells, that would also support a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. And if there was a complete lack of Merkel cell retention, then that would help support a morpheiform basal. Typically BCL2 should be more diffusely positive in a morpheiform basal but not as much uh, diffusely positive in a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. So you have to take a lot of things into account to, to make the diagnosis, but uh, depth of invasion is a huge part of that as well. And there are, uh, there's a nice summary table in Elston, which kind of goes over what I just discussed here. Um, and so uh, you can review this on your own as well. The Paisley tie differential includes those entities we just discussed, the morpheiform basal cell and the desmoplastic trichoepithelioma. It also includes the microcystic adnexal carcinoma, which I mentioned, which is an adnexal tumor um, that has 
small uh, ductile-like uh, neoplastic islands that in, can invade and is actually uh, has some pretty uh, aggressive infiltrative behavior. You can also have uh, perineural invasion, et cetera. So it's, it's important to um, get a deep biopsy for those. Syringomas are usually small papules. They don't have an invasive architecture and they're, they're benign, but they do have this tadpole-like uh, neoplastic, um, tadpole neoplastic islands that have these small ducts in them. So if you think syringoma, I like to think of a microcystic adnexal carcinoma as like a malignant form of a syringoma in a way. Infiltrated BCCs. So you see spiky growth in an infiltrated BCC. You see um, areas that appear to have this kind of invasive architecture going down into the fibromucinous stroma. You have fibroblast rich stroma, and you can see, still see some areas of retraction that fits along with your other basal cell subtypes. Um, you can have some areas of squamous differentiation and perineal invasion as well. Infundibulocystic basal cell carcinoma, um, this resembles something, sometimes people even call it adenoid um, basal cell carcinoma, but uh, essentially what you have is a, a basal cell carcinoma that has these very thin pink strands uh, with surrounding basaloid staining, um, some areas of blue basaloid budding, which is more typical of your basal cell, and even some horn cysts. So it's kind of like a a cross between a seborrheic keratosis or like a reticulated seborrheic keratosis and a basal cell carcinoma. Now, if you were to stain this for a Burette 4, and if it was a basal cell that was of the infundibulocystic type, you would be getting a lot of these um, islands highlighting with Burette 4. Now, if this were a reticulated seborrheic keratosis, it should be completely negative on Burette 4 staining. So the reason that the um, this subtype exists is that it helps to clue you in that there is some differentiation towards the follicular inf infundibulum in this tumor. The pink strands of the squamous epithelium um, represent the parts of the neoplastic cells that were differentiating more towards your classic squame in a way. However, most people would not call this a basosquamous carcinoma. Um, it closely resembles another entity called a basaloid follicular ham hamartoma, which is an entity uh, that is not considered a, necessarily a malignant neoplasm. It's more of a hamartoma. Now, hamartomas are overgrowth of normal components. So uh, again, if you do the burrup four stain, this is positive and you find a lot more cellular pleomorphism, um, some areas of infiltration. Uh, then you can lean your, uh, your, you can start to favor in your differential diagnosis and infundibulocystic basal cell versus some of those other variants of hamartomas, such as a basaloid follicular hamartoma. Fibroepithelioma of pincus is a little bit controversial. Some people say it is, some people say it isn't a subtype of basal cell carcinoma. Um, I tend to view it as its own little entity because the histology is pretty um, classic in many ways. And also I think that these need to be excised with negative margins or they continue to locally grow. So here is the classic, um, the classic um, histology of a fibroepithelioma of pinkness. And you can see this anastomosing pink epithelial strands that are embedded in a fibromyxoid stroma. And I like to kind of see it from the low power. You see these very thin reticulating anastomosing strands with this very pale um, kind of extracellular material in between them. Um, it's, it's technically fibromyxoid stroma, but I think that a lot of it can just be abundant mucin very acellular in many areas. So this is a very unique um, pathology. Now it can be confused with other entities such as a syringro fibroadenoma. And um, sometimes there's um, entities such as a fibro folliculoma that can sometimes look like this, unfortunately. And so um, you have to get on high power and look for these uh, 
uh, blue buds. And if you did a burrup four stain, I, I believe that you, you should also get some positivity here. Um, that's not always going to help you separate it from those other entities. You can see the duct formation, which you can also see in a syringofibradinoma, which again, I said, makes it difficult to completely um, make a separation between fibroepithelioma pincus. So if you're having trouble, you may have to sign this out as a, um, you know, atypical basaloid neoplasm with uh, fine reticulation and in, in the comment to talk about uh, the fact that there's abundant basaloid budding and you suspect a fibroepithelioma of pincus more so than a, a syringofibroadenoma, which should not have as much of those basaloid, those kind of classic, more basal cell related buddings there. But you can still see a lot of ducts in both the fibroepithelioma of pincus and syringofibroadenoma. Adenoid BCC, which I um, said that sometimes people switch back and forth between infundibulocystic and adenoid BCC because they can look very similar. But here, um, this is a more pure form of an adenoid variant of a basal cell carcinoma where you have these um, areas of blue islands with an adenoid pattern, which means clear spaces in the middle of the island. So you're getting these openings. Whereas in that infundibulocystic uh, basal cell carcinoma, you have a lot more areas of the keratin. Um, the, the little pseudocyst formations, the little keratin islands. Here, you just mainly have um, the basaloid islands with a lot of the uh, clear spaces in the middle of those islands. You still see the traditional peripheral palisading, the fibromyxoid stroma, and the retraction artifact. Moving on to basal cell nevus syndrome, which is a genodermatosis that all dermatology residents should be aware of. So basal cell nevus syndrome is also known as Gorlin syndrome. It's a result of a patch mutation, which is a transmembrane protein involved in the sonic hedgehog pathway. This leads to increased smoothened activity, which leads to uncontrolled cell proliferation through GLE-1 through 3, which are transcription factors. It's an autosomal dominant entity, but 50% can be sporadic as new mutations. These patients often have epidermoid cysts, as well as milia, basal cell carcinomas, as expected, palmoplantar pits, odontogenic jaw cysts, frontal bossing, bifid ribs, vertebral fusion, and kyphoscoliosis. So definitely a mixture of clinical findings that can help lead you to the diagnosis before you get genetic testing. Central nervous system can be affected as well, where you have agenesis of the corpus callosum, calcified bulk cerebrum, you can have development of medulloblastomas and meningiomas, and even some mental retardation. Eye problems can exist, including hypertelorism. The GU system can be affected with ovarian fibromas. You can have cardiac fibromas. The treatment for this entity includes a dental panoramic x-ray, annual MRIs, and you can treat this patient with vismotigib, which can help um, you know, uh, restore the uh, normal sonic hedgehog pathway. Basically, it's a smoothened inhibitor. And so what happens is you're, you're dampening down this overactivated smoothened activity. Nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, also known as gorlin golt syndrome. Clinical findings include skeletal abnormalities as well as shallow palmar plantar pits and calcification of the falx cerebri. Associated uh, tumors include the uh, odontogenic keratosis, desmoplastic medulloblastoma, and cardiac and ovarian fibromas, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, the key thing is that you should know that it sometimes goes by gorlin golt syndrome, and it sometimes goes by nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Um, but you should uh, remember the role of the patch one mutation, and you should remember that this is associated with the sonic he hedgehog pathway uh, overactivity, and you should know about this motogib being a treatment as well. You should also know that um, epidermoid cysts are very common in these patients, as well as basal cell carcinomas and everything else that we've mentioned here. Basex du Precristal syndrome is a, a different genodermatosis, which can have multiple basal cell carcinomas developed by the ages of 10, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but even young adults will start to get multiple basal cell carcinomas. It's an excellent dominant inheritance pattern. 
Over here on the right, we are showing not a picture of basal cell, but a picture of follicular atrophoderma, where you have prominent follicular ostea, follicular dilatation and plugging, as well as hypertrichosis. You have a uh, development of a lot of milia, and these patients experience hypohydrosis, 27% of them. As I said, X-link dominant, but the gene is currently unknown. It's similar to Rombo syndrome. Um, in Rombo syndrome, you've got basal cell uh, carcinomas as well. And, um, and so it's very similar in that aspect. You can also see follicular atrophoderma in um, both of these entities. And you can see um, similar findings in, in both of these. There's a lot of crosstalk. You can have lurethrema oophorogenes. You can have spiny hyperkeratosis. You can have hypotrichosis and a, a variant of um, hair shaft change called pili torti. You can have hypohydrosis of the face, facial hyperpigmentation and milia, and multiple genital trichotheliomas as well. Rombo syndrome, as I just alluded to, is very similar um, to basex to precrystal, except these typically they do not have hypohydrosis. But this is an autosomal dominant inheritance compared to the basex to precrystal, which is excellent dominant. So rombo syndrome is autosomal dominant inheritance and um, along with those constellations of findings that you can see in Bayes X, saw, if the patient is not exhibiting hypohydrosis, that can be the, the tip off if uh, they give you a vignette and you're expected to make this, um, this diagnosis. Atrophoderma vermiculata, you can see here is symmetrical involvement of the face by crowded areas of atrophy separated by narrow ridges. There's just kind of worm eaten or vermiculate appearance, which results from atrophy of the follicles and the surrounding skin. It's also uh, not a very clean syndrome in terms of genetics. There's still an unknown gene pattern. In Rombo syndrome, you get basal cell carcinomas, you get trichoepitheliomas, atrophoderma vermiculatum, as we mentioned, hypotrichosis. Also remember you get cyanosis of the hands and the feet, milia and telangiectasia in Rombo syndrome. And no hypohydrosis, as I mentioned on the previous slide, versus the presence of hypohydrosis in Bayes extra precristal. Paget's disease is um, usually presents as erythematous and even macerated or ulcerating plaques that can be on anywhere on the body um, if it's extra mammary. But if it's mammary, it's going to be on the breast and um, it can be around the nipple area. Um, usually, if you've got Paget's disease, it's a uh, represent, representation of an underlying breast cancer. So it's essentially related to that adenocarcinoma um, of the breast cancer. Um, and then that's your primary mammary Paget's disease, but you can have extra mammary Paget's where extra mammary um, sites include areas all over the body, but most commonly the anogenital region. You can have a primary extra mammary Paget's or even a secondary extra mammary Paget's. The primaries are often um, directly derived from cutaneous adnexal or visceral structures, but with extra mammary pages, the most important thing to remember is that um, if you have a, an extra mammary paget, CK7 is most likely positive in a primary extra, uh, extra mammary pages, and CK7 is usually negative in a secondary extra mammary pageants. And there are some exceptions to the rule, but just to introduce you to that basic concept now, since we're discussing it. Um, and then usually secondary extra mammary pageants is due to an underlying adenocarcinoma. It could be a colonic or a you know, lower uh, bowel adenocarcinoma. It could be an anogenital adenocarcinoma of some sort. And then what you have is secondary uh, extension into the skin. And those are often CK7 negative and CK20 positive more often than not. They can also be CDX2 positive if they are sharing in common some of the immunophenotype of the underlying um, lower gastrointestinal adenocarcinoma. So if you've heard of the term pagetoid and you think about Paget's disease, it's not surprising that on histology, you're going to see a pagetoid spread of neoplastic cells with a nest. It can look a lot like a pagetoid squamous cell carcinoma or even a pagetoid melanoma. And so 
doing stains for CK7 will be very high yield to help you uh, narrow in on the fact that this is most likely a Paget's disease. Um, CEA can also be very helpful and PAS positive um, islands can also be indicative of a Paget's disease. If it's diastase resistant, then that means that it's probably um, the sialomucin, which is being produced by the, the tumor itself. So you do see on path intraepidermal proliferation of large cells with ample amphiphilic cytoplasm. The tumor cells are kind of in that buckshot distribution. And so again, it, no one would blame me for confusing this uh, for a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, but I hope you can appreciate there are some differences here. These cells are a little bit more separated out as individual clonal neoplastic cells um, in a background of a relatively normal epidermis or um, the epidermis could have some glassy changes because it's unhealthy. It's being occupied by so many of these neoplastic cells, but it just has a, a different look and you have to see a lot of examples to really um, get, get an appreciation for that. Just some more examples of um, Paget's disease. You can see uh, some, some down here with these single uh, cells with the abundant amphiphilic cytoplasm. Again, if in real life, if there's any doubt that you're gonna do a CK7 and even on a testing situation, they'd probably tell you it's CK7 positive, just so that way you are able to uh, make the diagnosis. Paget's disease, including mammary pagets, like I said, or extra mammary pagets, which is not on the breast. Primary cutaneous is usually negative for CK20, positive for CK7. And it's also positive for GCDFP15, which is gross cystic disease fluid protein 15. The secondaries are usually positive for CK20 and negative for gross cystic disease fluid protein 15. CK7 positive, CEA positive, and PAS diastase resistant positive. Pagetoid squamous cell carcinoma in situ is negative for CK7 and negative for CEA. And then your pagetoid melanoma is going to be uh, positive for S100 and SOX10, whereas with the Pagus disease, it's going to be negative for S100 and SOX10. Here's the differential diagnosis, as I mentioned. So uh, buckshot scatter here on the left, but it's melanoma. You know that because these cells would stain for SOX10 and S100, HMB45, which is a marker of melanocytes as well in the junction, but also dermal melanoma more often than not. Um, so HMB45 can be pretty helpful. Um, there's a new marker called CRAME, which um, can be helpful to establish a malignant phenotype in many different types of cancers, but more so melanomas than other types of cancers. Um, but I do think just doing your basic melanocyte stains is all that's required here because this architecture is already worrisome here with this abundant pagetoid. Bowen disease, uh, you're going to have more keratin positivity in the neoplastic cells as expected. And you can have an intraepidermal porocarcinoma, which is related to acrosyndral keratinocytes. You get this demonstration of focal duct differentiation. You may have adjacent benign hydroacanthoma simplex, and that can look very similar as well. Here's just a summary uh, slide to show you how you can differentiate between extra mammary Paget's disease primary, extra mammary Paget's disease secondary, Bowen disease or SCCIS, and superficial spreading melanoma. So if you, if you wanna start uh, with the most simplest thing on the right, you can see that superficial spreading melanoma is gonna be positive from uh, Fontana Masson, which will stain the um, melanin black actually. So this is not an immunohistochemical stain. This is a special stain. And then down here, S100 and not included here, SOX10 positive and melanin positive. So those are the important markers to establish a melanoma in situ with a pagetoid uh, uh, architecture. Bowen's disease, you're gonna be looking for positivity of pankeratin as well as plus or minus CK7. So that makes it a little bit tricky. Um, but usually uh, your extra mammary Paget's primary will be um, positive for pancaritin and your secondary will also be positive. And so, um, you know, CK7 is not the magic stain uh, by any means. You'll, you'll probably have to do a few more stains to really uh, help out. And so the CEA stain is going to be very helpful. If you do a CK7 and a CEA, those are both positive. You're probably dealing with a Paget's, either primary or secondary. 
Um, whereas if the CEA is negative, even if the CK7 is positive, then um, you're probably dealing with uh, Bowen's. Now, most often the CK7 is going to be negative in Bowen's disease. So just keep that in mind. But um, if, if you do get positivity, it's probably better to just go ahead and do a CEA, especially if you're thinking that um, it's most likely a squame in situ. So there is a lot of tabular inf inf uh, information here on this slide. So I will include it just for your self-review as the last slide here. So you can look through the uh, special stain and immuno uh, histochemical profile and kind of get a better sense of usually what we do work up. I will end though with uh, just pointing out again and emphasizing that, like I said, primary extra memory pagets is usually positive for CK7 and negative for CK20. And although here on this table, it says extra memory Paget's disease, um, secondary is uh, CK20, uh, CK7 positive and CK20 positive. Usually the, um, from different sources that, I, that I've read, the CK7 is actually negative in most cases of extra memory Paget's disease at secondary. That being said, um, there are a few underlying adenocarcinomas such as like bladder cancer and things like that, that can actually preserve the CK7 expression. And so I wouldn't necessarily rely on um, the CK7 alone. I would do all the stains, including CK7, CK20, um, and, and then uh, backtrack. Now, if you have a CK20 positive tumor, you're going to definitely have to rule out internal malignancy in those patients. Um, but for testing purposes, you need to know that the CK7 is going to be positive in Paget's disease. And that is uh, all I have for the, the major um, entities. Now, there is one uh, entity in the Elston textbook that um, he ends a chapter with called a lymphoepithelioma-like carcinoma. It seems very rare, but I actually came across a couple of these in my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. So uh, you basically have this atypical epithelial nest centered in, uh, surrounded by pretty bland looking lymphocytes. And so at scan, it almost looks like a germinal center um, because you have so many lymphocytes and then you have this paler center in the middle. It almost looks like it could be a cutaneous lymphoma or some type of follicular uh, germinative center. But if you were to do immunohistochemistry, these cells in the center are actually keratin positive atypical epithelial cells. And then what you have are just some surrounding lymphocytes. The prognosis is generally good, fortunately. However, nasopharyngeal lymphoepithelioma can have a similar appearance. And so metastatic disease should be ruled out. So you find this in the skin, you definitely have to make sure they didn't have some type of nasopharyngeal lymphoepithelioma. Cutaneous lesions are usually negative for Epstein-Barr virus, but if there is a nasopharyngeal counterpart, then those are typically Epstein-Barr virus positive. Just another picture of that lymphoepithelioma-like carcinoma. It looks like a nodular lymphoid proliferation with a germinal center, but it's just actually um, atypical epithelial cells surrounded by lymphocytes. And so when I got these cases, the couple of cases that I looked at in the fellowship, the we were sent um, these in consultation. The person sending it wasn't sure what it was, but we did the keratin stains and we demonstrated that these are indeed atypical keratin positive cells. And then they were surrounded diffusely by lymphocytes. So we made that, our diagnosis, we favored lymphoepithelioma like carcinoma. And so that's all I have for this lecture. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, please contact me.